Okay, so this is number four. Preacher's Academy number four. We're going to look at Psalm 103. Actually, there's a lot of scriptures in here. Um, and we'll probably next month have some more instruction on teaching, and then we'll go into preaching. Um, that way, you can get your preach on. We'll see what happens. And then we'll just go from there, because you'll need longer and longer practices. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, I really didn't know where to start because I hadn't been able to work on the Preacher's Academy since, oh, I don't know, the last time we got together. And I was having to do it today in the midst of trying to get all this other stuff done. And so I was sitting there like, all right, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to teach them? Because <laughs> I was like, I no idea. But one thing he showed me that's really neat is, and I wrote it down here for you guys, the number one purpose for teaching is to instruct Christians in the ways of God so they can walk in them. Shh. Where's your nose? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. It's like, where? Um, so it's kind of like, just liken it to where a child is learned, or taught, and learns how to walk, talk, feed themselves, crawl even. They say it's really important for they can start walking. All of those things, they're being taught how to basically be a human. You know, and, and it's important because, you know, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but when you have little kids, sometimes they want to play like they're animals, so you can't have like the dog season. And I could not get them back like a human. And so you're basically teaching them ways so that they're successful in life. It's the same thing with the Christian teacher teaching believers is how they can be successful in their Christian walk. So that is the number one purpose. And so when you're teaching and instructing in the Word of God, you want there to be lessons that they get out of it that they can apply, you know, in their Christian life, okay? And you should see progress. You know, if you've got... Oh, and that's kind of like one of the things we've talked about where you have churches that focus only on getting people born again. And that's great. That's great. That's their, their function. But then you have churches that only teach elementary principles, and that's fine too, but you will outgrow those churches. You've got to have apostolic doctrine, and if the, the Christian stays hooked into that type of teaching, then they will actually begin to look more like Christ, and they will grow. If they don't get apostolic teaching, then they will stay immature. So I bet we could all name someone that's been born again for 10, 15, 20 years that is in the same place they were when they initially had their encounter with God. That means they did not get good instruction, okay? If you don't um, get good instruction, another thing that can happen is you can actually lose that baby. So if you have a baby and you just, you know, hope it fends for itself, uh, it's going to end up dying, right? It's the same thing with Christians. God puts the responsibility of the believer to be instructed, but also anyone that's born in the house the people around him or her need to take the responsibility for helping that Christian in the ways of God. Okay? So it's not just um, the parents, so to speak. It does take a village to raise a child. Okay? So what happens is a lot of times churches rely on the pastor to raise the babies, and they do have an important part to play, but it's actually all believers. And I think, you know, Paul made it plain that y'all should be teaching by now, but instead we're having to go over, you know, elementary things. So I feel that you guys are progressing in how you can instruct people and, and getting them filled with the Holy Ghost and all of that stuff so that whenever babies come in the future, whenever what God is going to do occurs, um, we'll be ready. We'll be prepared to help the babies. Okay? Gotta help the babies. All right. So in Psalm 103, verse 7, it says, He made known, known His ways to Moses and His acts to the children of Israel. Now, the word way, okay, so if we're talking about instructing people in the way of the Lord, it means a path journey and a path traveled. So what this is speaking of in verse 7, it says that God made known His paths way he travels, the way he walks, the way he does life to Moses. The children of Israel were not open to those things, therefore they only saw his power. Okay? So that's important to understand. It's also metaphorically 
the pathway of one's life suggesting a pattern of life, the obedient life, and the righteous life. Now the word acts is deeds and actions. So you'll find there's actually two types of Christians. You have those that are word-based and those that are power or supernatural based. Okay? So liken it to, like a lot of times when I train people, I tell them females usually can build legs easier. <coughs> They're, they have more leg than men because we're childbearing. Men, have you ever seen those men that they only train the upper body and then their legs are like chicken legs? Okay, so liken the people that have the real stocky legs to word-based people. They have good foundation. They're very strong in the word. They can walk for long distances. They're very stable in storms. But if you try to bring the supernatural into it, they'll often shut down. No, we just need the word. Well, where's that in the word? All the time. Where's that in the word? I've been asked that so many times. Then you have the supernatural people, the ones that go from supernatural conference to supernatural conference, and they're always seeking this experience that they have the big upper body where they can show the power of God, they can show the mind of God, but they have little legs. So when storms come, when they need to draw the word of God, uh, they don't have any basis, they don't have any foundation, and they're very unstable. They'll be tossed to and fro. You can any new doctrine, any new whatever, they'll go with it. Those people are very in, much in danger for being deceived by false prophets and false teachers. Because false prophets, and this is important, false teachers work signs. Okay? So there's lying signs and wonders. And often, you don't recognize a false prophet or false teacher because, based on their signs, it's their fruit. So the signs will blind <coughs> you to what's going on. Remember, the Lord didn't say, you'll know them by their signs, wonders, and miracles. He said, you'll know them by their fruit. And so you have to have uh, both. And in uh, Mark chapter 12, one of the examples of someone that did not have both are the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in the supernatural. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in the power of God. The Sadducees were another religious, religious group, did not believe in the power of God. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And uh, so they, they tried to trick them. <laughs> But anyway, uh, let's see, Mark 12, 24. And, and, then, and I like to get into religious discussion. Let's actually start, let's start in verse 18, Mark 12, 18. Let's just kind of get the background here. Because they've already tried to trip them up, the Pharisees. Now he's got the Sadducees coming. It says, Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind, and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died and left no offspring. The second took her and he died, and he didn't leave any offspring. The third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring, and then finally the woman died. Do you see the ridiculous, confusing, religious argument they're trying to do? Religious people will use a whole bunch of fancy words and weird equations and all kinds of numbers and stuff like that. And before you know it, you're like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> so yeah, that's what they're doing. So then they say, therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? First brother, second, seventh. For all seven had her as a wife. Then this is what Jesus said. Are you not therefore mistaken or in error because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? You have to know both. Don't be flaky to where you have little legs, and don't be so grounded that you have tiny arms. Okay? Be well rounded. And, uh, and then he you know, tells them, you know, when they rise from the dead, there's not marriage in heaven. It, you know, there's not going to be any husband and wife in heaven. Okay? So, to avoid error, firm foundation of the Word of God, firm foundation of the supernatural power. All right? You guys awake? Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read a few psalms uh, to you guys. Psalm 25, 4 through 8. Notice they came to him as teacher, too, not Messiah. Mm -hmm. All right. So it says, um, show me your ways. So that reveals they have to be 
revealed. O oh Lord, teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. And then 2711. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path. Why? Because of my enemies. The more instruction you have, which we're going to get into a little bit, but the more teaching and instruction you take into yourself, the wiser you get. So that when your enemies come to you and say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. You know, what does the law say? And he had to sit there and get his answer from Holy Spirit so that he did not tell them to break the law, but he also saved the woman. And so the enemy will try to trip you up. You know what I mean? And so the more instruction you have, the more word, the less trippable you are. In fact, the more instruction you have, and this is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so you might want to write it down, the less offended you get. Because the word offense in the Greek is scandalon, which is a bait or trap that when you take it, it snags you. And it's hidden, it's covert. But if you're aware of the enemy's tactics, aware of his strategies, when he tries to offend you, you'll recognize it because you've got a lot of word in you and it, it's like an alarm goes off. One of the things I've been asking for, which is why I'm playing almost getting ran off the road all the time, Lord, I want to become unoffendable. I want to be unoffendable. Mm -hmm. Unoffendable. <laughs> so when people offend me, I want to be unoffendable. So I'm going to get some more word in for sure. But anyway, and then, um, so your enemies, the more teaching you get, the more uh, secure you'll be. And then Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite or join my heart to fear your name. So the main thing I want you to see is in order to be a good teacher, you need to be a good student in the ways of God. Okay? And how He works. He works in a certain way. And the more you know those ways, the better off you are. So we've got the Israelites and Moses. So Moses knew God, his character, how he worked, how he thought, how he did things. The Israelites didn't, so they died in the wilderness. So it's, it's just simply not enough to see him move. You have to know him. And if he's the Word, the more you know the Word, the more you know him, if you're reading it by the Spirit. If you're reading it in intellectual knowledge or religious knowledge, it won't work. Now, um, I'm going to give you some scriptures in your notes. We're not going to turn to them. But in Proverbs 1 7, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the word knowledge is learning, discernment, and insight. So the more fear of the Lord, the more you begin to have knowledge, the more you'll discern things which is very important. It's also associated with wisdom. <coughs> Proverbs 1.3 says the Proverbs were written to give an instruction of wisdom. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus is to us wisdom. So basically, we're teaching Jesus. That is the way of God. Didn't he say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life? So he's the way to the path of truth, which is the path of life. Okay? Basically, when we learn how he works, we just follow him in his footsteps. Huh? We just go right in the path that he walked. It's important, it's important as a teacher to be instructed the Lord and then impart that instruction to others, which we're going to get into detail next uh, time we meet. As believers mature in the ways of God, they'll begin to walk in greater discernment, insight, and wisdom, influencing decisions in their lives. Until then, the young believer needs to have trusted, mature believers in the ways of God to filter things through. By mature, I do not necessarily mean physical age, but those who have walked in the ways of God for years and have fruit. Those who fear God will receive instruction. Those who are fools will not. God gives a responsibility of receiving instruction to the individual. When you're learning from God or you're instructing others, picture in your mind that Jesus as wisdom is personally instructing you. Or them. You know? <coughs> Alright, so 
Here's something you should have never saw before. Uh, let's look at Psalm 143. I never saw this. And maybe look at teaching in a different way. Because, you know, we talk about how preaching is more fun. But teaching is vital, and it's also a sign of compassion. Psalm 143, verse 10 and 11. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Now, um, we're going to look at 1 Kings before we get into this even more. 1 Kings 8.35 and 36. When the heavens are shut up, and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. When they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them or chastise. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. Now, a prophetic sign of revival is rain. Anointed teaching, consistent anointed teaching, creates revival. I never saw that before. Um, in Psalm 143, we see that learning to do God's will leads to reviving of the soul. Here we see that lack of rain was a result of sin. The return of rain is a result of repentance because they were able to learn the way they should walk. This is one reason, reason teaching is so crucial it brings repentance and then revival. And it's only, I mean, that only makes sense because the more instruction you have, the more you look like Christ. So you got a bunch of people that are living, breathing, speaking like Christ. Of course you're going to have mm -hmm. restoration. You know what I mean? And uh, so as we learn more of how the Lord works, it also makes the supernatural easier. Because we can be in a situation, have no idea what to do, and then we'll have Holy Spirit just guiding us through so that when we come out of the other side of that ministry opportunity, we will end up looking brilliant, even though we were the ones sitting there like, I don't even know what I'm doing. And I've been there before. I'm sure you guys have too, where all of a sudden words will just come up. And like, yeah, that's good. I'm praying for scripture, my friends. I can go back and study it. You know, things like that or... A difficult situation, even at work or in relationships or whatever, where all of a sudden you just know the answer and you know what to do. So that's where um, the, the movement, I guess you would say, begins, is knowing the way of God. So people that refuse to learn His ways, get stuck in His power, will actually die in the wilderness versus those that know both. Mm. Okay? So you have to know both. And I think that you can know the word and get stuck in the wilderness too because you're like dry as, you know, like waffling the water. <laughs> no green anywhere. <laughs> now, um, as the people of God begin to walk in His ways and His power, a movement begins. That's how the early church grew and took so much of the known world over. In fact, when the Romans tried to kill them off, you know, by the time they got done after 300 years, uh, you know, they're pretty stubborn. 50% of the Roman population was born again, spirit-filled. The way it died is when the Word of God was taken away from the people of God, and it was handed over to elite ministers, and they were given the job of interpreting the Scriptures and passing it down, you know, to us uh, common people. <coughs> that's what happened. Laymen, that's what that means, is common. <coughs> In fact, they had Bibles chained to the podiums, and they were in Latin, and no one spoke Latin by that time. So you had this whole dark ages, and get this, lack of teaching or instructing in the Word of God by the common people led to the dark ages. Impacted the entire world. But when some strong and courageous men said, you know what, enough of this. 
and they began to put the Bible in the language of the people, and the people got a hold of it, it caused the Reformation and brought light back into society. That's why the enemy tries to either pervert the word or snuff it out. If he can get darkness, and, and that's incredible to me. When the Lord said, let's just go with this. When, the, when God said, let there be light, we know he was not referring to the sun, the moon, or the stars because that didn't come until the fourth day. He was releasing the light, releasing the light of the word of God into the universe that began to <coughs> this creative process. And he separated day from night, and night means to twist away. So then we've got John 1, 1 through 3 that says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Darkness tried to overtake it, but it couldn't prevail. So the enemy will seek to silence light, which is the Word. Okay? So that's why I believe that there's so much emphasis on political correctness because it's another weapon to silence light. You know, so we've got to be aware of these things, how the enemy, how is he moving right now to get the Word of God shut down? Because he knows if he can do that, then it'll throw a country into chaos. Okay? Uh, let's see. Christians, knowing the ways of God brings light, not just to the body, but the whole world. All right, we're going to go back to Mark, chapter 12. You know what's funny? Before the Chinese persecution, um, there were one million Christians. And uh, after the Chinese persecution, there's a hundred million. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, you know, well, I'm just going to give you a couple thoughts because I've been pondering this in between. Um, crazy, you know, stuff going on. But I've been pondering something. So, you have a million Christians in China. Obviously, they have a word. To them, Bibles are so precious that they, if they have like a piece of it, they'll, they'll protect it and they'll, they'll teach from that and meditate on it, you know, in, in their underground meetings. And so, the Chinese persecution has attempted to stop this, but they have the word. Well, um, one of the things I find interesting is, you know, like a lot of people are talking about, um, you know, the end of the age is approaching, obviously, I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer, it's been approaching since it began, <laughs> so, you know, but one of the things is this whole um, one world order, all of that stuff, okay? So Christians would do well to get as much word in them as possible and to press it or pass it on to their children as possible, but get this. So the uh, the country of Britain leaving the EU. Now let me tell you how significant that it is prophetically. It is God's grace because everybody has said that the EU is part of the end time one world government. And out of God's mercy, the people of that country rose up and said, We are tired of being told we can't have toasters. We are tired of being told that we have to take immigrants in that want to kill us. We're tired of all of this. And they stood up and they have literally stopped something that the enemy is pushing prematurely. You know what that means for us? What we've been saying. The greatest movement in Christianity in America is at the door. Because if you've got that over there, I guarantee you it's happening here. You know what I mean? So it's not the end yet. Mm -hmm. The tribulation is not starting yet. God, in His mercy and grace, is giving us more time to get the Christians mobilized so that when it really does begin, you will have a people that are in the Word and the power that know their God. Let me show you this scripture. It's in Daniel. It's on your notes. You're probably going to write this down. <clears throat> I believe it's chapter 11. Let me find it. Yeah. Daniel 11, 32 through 35. So this is speaking of the Antichrist. But it was also partially fulfilled during um, Antiochus Epiphanes' 
uh, reign over Israel where he slaughtered the pig and his abomination of desolation, the Maccabees, and all that happened. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he will corrupt or pollute with flattery, but the people who know their God, not his acts, but know God, okay, shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they will fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they'll be aided with a little help, but many will join them by intrigue or flattery. So you have false Christians coming in. Okay? And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine, purify, and make them white until the time of the end because it's still for an appointed time. Do you see the role of instruction? The role of instruction. So you've got this situation that happened at that time, but will happen again. Because remember, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, he was telling the Israelites, when you see that, don't go back to your house. Don't go back. You know, run to the hills. Now we as believers, it's a little different, but these are Israelites that the Bible says that when the Lord shows up, there will be such an intense purging and refining that only a third will remain. And so, he says, when you see this, run. Those that obey will be protected. During the time of this, we who know the word will be instructing because it's going to spread like wildfire all over the world. So I just want to stress to you guys the importance of teaching. You know, that it's not just getting a good message together. You're literally forging and forming the character of people and preparing them for persecution, preparing them for difficult times, bringing encouragement like, well, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because of this, and it's revealing the ways of God to them. And it's also preserving a lot of people in the world. One of the things I found extraordinary is when the Roman Empire fell, just a little quick another history lesson, you know how the civilization was saved? By a Roman monk. I mean, an Irish monk. And he was a slave, and he was in his field one day working, and God told him, start walking. And so he just started walking. And then he said, now go here, go here, go there. He got to the shore, and then the Lord said, go talk to that man, he'll let you on his ship. He said, no. So he sat down and waited, and then the guy came over and said, well, where do you need to go? Ireland. He said, okay, I'll take you. He goes to Ireland, and with him, he takes the ability to read the scriptures and to read words. And so when he got over to Ireland, it's how the Irish saved civilization. He trained other monks to read and write, and they preserved the scriptures, and it kept uh, civilization from going into utter darkness because of a lack of the ability to read and write. That is amazing to me. And they did it with scriptures, the Word of God. So it's powerful, the light of God. And do you know that your words never stop? Science has shown they just keep being sounded forth, and they don't know how long. They've had words where they picked them up on signals, radio signals, that would interfere with broadcasts that were from like the 1950s, you know? And so your words are ever going forth producing good or bad. So that's why we have the power of God to cancel out the bad, right? So anyway, it's just, it's powerful. It's powerful. Now, a very, very important characteristic of being a teacher is not having fear of man. That is way <laughs> important. <laughs> you, get, you cannot fear man. All right? Um, here's a couple things that can happen. So, if you fear man more than God, or if there's a spirit of greed, and, and you'll see this sometimes in churches, they will begin to fa fashion their messages not on what Holy Spirit is telling them to say, but how they can keep everybody pacified and everybody happy so they'll keep giving their tithes. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'm sure y'all noticed the furnace. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> but you've got to care about the people more than them liking you, and you have to care about the people more than money. You know what I mean? And if a person cannot receive the Word of God they leave, that's on them. So you just have to preach truth. Guys, there have been times that I have been preparing a message, and God tells me something that is so... <clears throat> like it hit me now I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not putting that in there and I'm like no I'm not doing it he got put it in there and he rebuked me once he said who do you think loves them more me or you 
Just put it in there. And I remember I was so anxious, I was so nervous to say it, you know, because I was afraid I'd hurt people or the people think I was harming them. And, uh, but you know what was interesting is, you know, some people would get upset, but most of the time people would receive it and then produce different, you know, choices or behaviors or changes. So, when you're crafting your message, you cannot think or, or be concerned with how it will be received. Okay? Now, you don't want to, you know, have attitude. You don't want to be all idiots and I'm here to correct everything because you're dumb. I mean, you don't have attitude. I mean, I've had to tell people they're being dumb sometimes, but um, God tells me that. <laughs> you're being stupid. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. So, often what will happen is your teaching will rile people, and, and we see it all through the Bible, and it's in your face, and it's challenging. So, here's what I recommend. Have compassion. So, even if you have to deliver a hard word, you know what the emotion is? There, it's very interesting. There's a seriousness. Uh, I'm, have any of you ever had to deliver a hard word? Okay. So there's a seriousness, but did y'all notice there's a deep compassion? If you don't have that compassion, you probably need to sell your message a little bit. Because <coughs> you want, teaching is actually a compassion gift, which I'm going to show you. But you want to have understanding where the people are at because you consider yourself lest you fall. Mm -hmm. Right? So you don't want to come at it in a way that's prideful. Um, now let's look at uh, back in Mark 12, 14. He's, he's still just getting, you know, challenged the word is. And it says, uh, Mark chapter 14 through 15. Well, religious leaders sent uh, some Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. Is what verse 13 said. When they had come to him, they said to him, Teacher, did you notice that again? If you think you're not going to be challenged, you start teaching, you'll be challenged. We know that you're true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or not pay? And he, knowing their hypocrisy, said, Why do you test me? So teachers need to be discerning, too. Did you notice the flattery? Okay? So... I don't know, this might be kind of a generalized statement, I might be incorrect, but sometimes I think teachers, well now I know it's true because it says knowledge without love puffs up. So you can have a lot of teachers, they got a lot of knowledge, but they're very puffy. I mean, you got any sharp instruments around, it might be dangerous. So the thing is, is that they were trying to come out with flattery. You have to be aware of flattery, uh, especially a teacher. Because that's that's what they'll do, and I've even had people like that Buddhist that kept showing up at the masters, and uh, he was a Buddhist and he was trying to prove that God did not exist and Christianity was a hoax, and he was going around to the different ministries and home groups. It was when we started the furnace, mm. and I, man, I knew the minute he walked in, I could feel that spirit of flattery, and uh, so I was like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> And he comes up and he starts off with very flattering words, just like this, and I'm sure you're very knowledgeable. And whenever people say that, I'm like, ah, I know what you're doing. And I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he goes, but how can you really prove that God is real? And I said, well, how can you prove that he's not? And uh, he said, oh, I see that you're very learned. And I'm just staring at him. I don't really say anything. And he goes, well, you know, I just believe that Christians, the reason they're Christians are believing in myth and you know, they need a crutch and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, well, uh, I have a question for you. And he goes, you know, because you can't see them all that. And I said, he goes, what? And I said, do you see air? Do you see oxygen? And he said, well, no. I said, do you believe it exists? <laughs> he goes, yeah. I said, why? Well, I'm alive. I said, there you go. You know? So he knew I better not mess with her because obviously, you know, so he went for the baby. And I'd watch him walk in and he'd go straight for her. So I'd get on the phone and I'd say, hey, Desiree, there's a dude coming back in that one. And uh, so if you have any problems, you let me know. <laughs> she said, okay. And we had this whole thing to watch out for him. And finally, lady, one of the ladies that came for the dancing was one of the feasts we did. She put him in her place and she let everybody know what he was doing. And he would act like he was a Christian, and he would use flattery. So you're going to see that. So the Lord saw it, but here's what I want to point out. They said, 
uh, you care about no one and you have no regard for the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. Okay? That's the best compliment you can get. That was a flattery right there. That was a compliment and they didn't realize it. So, the religious people were using the Lord's lack of fear of man to try to trick him. It didn't work. And it's also evident from their words that his messages were very well known for not mincing words. Now, Acts 4, 17. What's that? Um, Mark, Mark, care for no one. You, you have care for no one and do not fear man. Uh, Mark 12, 14 through 15. All right, and then Acts 4, 17 through 18. Now, this is after Peter and John healed the lame man, right, uh, at the gate beautiful. Uh, the same man had denied the Lord less than 50 days before, or about 50 days before, and they're brought before the religious leaders. And they tell them, uh, so they called and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they had all glorified God for what had been done. Uh, teaching needs to be supernatural. There needs to be some you know, definite supernatural with it. And that will often shut up the voice of the religious. Those demons may get riled up. But notice, we don't want you to teach in the name. Of Jesus. I'm suspect of any church that teaches principles out of books, things like that, and they don't teach Jesus. You know, there's entire churches, they don't say his name. They'll say God, um, Father, but they, you know, they don't say his name. Yeah. And that name is powerful because that name is exalted above every name. And they knew that name was dangerous. And they thought that they got rid of them and they hadn't. <coughs> Let's flip over to 5, 28, and 29. So they're again in trouble again. Brought before the, <laughs> the courts. And it says, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. <laughs> and it didn't bring this man's blood on us. But Peter said, We ought to obey God rather than man. And he proceeded to say, You murdered him. I mean, he was, bam, in your face. And one of the most brilliant teachings was from Stephen. And as he instructed, his face began to glow. As he's instructing, he enters into a, a vision and sees the Lord stand up to receive him. He shares what his vision is, and that's when they're like, ah, they turn their robes and pick up stones and, you know, uh, murder him because his teaching was so anointed that he stepped into a new realm. Isn't that incredible? So here, you know, they're getting all wrong, getting all upset, but they filled Jerusalem with the doctrine. That's my plan. I want to fill Clovis with the do you know, apostolic doctrine where we've got religious people like, you know, they're teaching, you know, bad stuff over there. And they're in a cult. Well, we've already been called a cult. <laughs> She's a Jezebel. She's teaching She's Jezebel. Well, I bet Chase is some minister side of town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was listening to our devotional spot. He's so funny. He said, yeah, he said, I went to a place called Far, Texas. Have you ever heard of Far, Texas? <laughs> and I'm like, no. And he said, it's Far, far Texas because it's down by the border with Mexico. He said, there's hardly anybody there. So I pitched my tent because God said to go there. And um, the mayor showed up. And, uh, and he said, and let me tell you, he said, at that point, we were hardly getting any uh, people, and our offerings were nickels. <laughs> and uh, he said, he said that the mayor showed up, and he's like, well, thank you, sir, for showing up and gracing us with your presence. He goes, well, this ain't no social call. He said, I forbid you to preach the name of Jesus. <sighs> and I forbid you to have this tent. He goes, well, I got all my permits. I don't care. I'll arrest you if you preach. He said, well, I guess you'll have to arrest me. So he goes up there does his message. Sure enough, they take him to jail. This happened so many times. <laughs> they had like 25 of the same charges which is illegal. Brought against him. But, so what would happen is every time it came for him to preach and he didn't come, his son would go and take the nickels and bail him out of jail. <laughs> and then he would come and he'd miss 
semester, and then sure enough, he got arrested, and it just happened every single day. He had to get bailed out of jail. He said, pretty soon, we didn't have enough nickels. He said, but what happened is word was going around that the preacher kept getting arrested, and now people want to see what's going on. You know, there are miracles and all kinds of stuff. So finally, finally, he goes before a judge, and he said, then there weren't enough nickels. He said, that judge was in the, the pocket of the mayor, and there were not enough nickels, and I was stuck. And he said, I even took him on a high-speed chase because they tried to get me between that and the tent, and he was trying to get to the tent because there's sanctuary. Sanctuary is awesome. Uh -huh. And he couldn't get there, and so they arrested him, put him in jail. Now, he said, there's a whole bunch of nickels I needed, and we didn't have them. And so a lawyer contacted him and said, hey, they're breaking the law. They can't forbid you to do this. So he went to court with them, and he demanded like him to get certain papers, stuff like that, went to court. Not only they got before a righteous judge, that judge said, Mayor, he said, you are in danger of going to jail yourself. He said, you take that law off the books right now, because they passed a law that you couldn't preach through a loudspeaker. That's how they kept getting him when he showed up. He said, you take that off the books right now. And he said, not only that, you will pay back all those nickels. And he said, and with 12% interest. <laughs> and so they got, it was like tens of thousands of dollars by the time this thing got done. So they had paid all that. Now he's got this money. Well, he's out of far Texas. So he's like, well, what do I do with all this money? And the Lord said, start a school. So he started a school in Tyler, Texas, on you know, the ministry and all that stuff. But it's like, no matter what the enemy throws at you, it's going to work for your good. You know what I mean? That's what happened to the lady that I told you went to prison, and uh, and God used me to help her, and now she does the food for the homeless. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. When he, I guess they came, and one time they even handcuffed her, and they said, you can't do this. And um, you're going to have to do some jail time. She says, whatever it has to do, I'm mm -hmm. going to continue doing it. Well. If you do it on the sidewalk, but don't do it on a park or whatever, mm -hmm. and she says, wherever. If I have to do it on the sidewalk, I will. She continued. She continued. Now she does it on a park. And even one of the police that came toward her time after time after time, he goes over there, and he stands all over the park to make sure that she's okay, and nobody's bothering her. That's awesome. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. amazing. This girl was a meth head. Yeah, that is And, great. you know, she... Sold drugs all over the world. Well, he told Where? one story um, that blew me away, and, and, and it kind of goes along with this a little they bit. They give her permit now. She's got permits. That's cool. Well, and he had permits too, but you know, yeah, they're trying to there's a permit yeah. that they make sure, and then they're in the process of um, getting grants to uh, transitional housing cool. for women with children. Well, I think it was in the same city of Far, Texas, where. Um, this lady, it's always women, you know, mamas and sisters and stuff, and came up to me and she said, now my, my son, in 30 minutes, will be put to death for a crime he did not commit. And she said, now I'm telling you, I can, I know when that boy lies, and he's done some things, but he did not kill those people. And uh, he said, all right, man, we'll pray. <clears throat> and he heard coming out of his mouth, and it scared him, because he's in front of all these people. And he heard coming out of his mouth, Lord, not only do we ask that you rescue this man, but that the killer, the true killer, will come forth and confess. What are the odds? What are the odds that some dude is on, you know, does a row for a crime and you're going to, oh, that was actually me? So he was freaking out. He prays that. He's freaking out. Man, you know, after he got done, his faith plummeted. Next day, he gets the newspaper. In the newspaper, front page, man prays for son not to be electrocuted, and he is saved. And the story was, 30 minutes before his execution, uh, the killer calls the DA and says, you're about to kill the wrong guy. Yes. He gives details of the murder, where it happened, the whole nine yards. She says, sir, how do you know this? He said, I'm the killer. He said, I will be there in 15 minutes. I'm turning myself in. He shows up. They obviously put a state of execution. He shows up. She goes, why would you confess? You could have gotten away with it. He goes, I don't know. He said, I was absolutely tormented. He said, I don't know what it was. All I knew is I had to call and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Oh, man. Okay, so um, here's something that's neat that God kind of started showing me a little bit today. But the teachings that Jesus gave his disciples, they're now teaching. 
That's why there's no copyright on teaching. Take a message, run with it, make it your own. You know what I mean? Like, whatever y'all hear, whatever y'all learn through any teaching, take it and, and teach it again. In fact, it was so funny. Um, I, I was working on the Reformation Center, and I had a message, uh, 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 Incarnation Continuum. I wanted to have it to be a title of one of the things, and basically it's the fact that Jesus lives in us now, and it's, we just continue what he started, you know. And that's Dr. Harfouche's title of the last you know, course. So I emailed uh, Esther and I said, would Dr. Harfouche mind if I use that in one of my teachings? Because, you know, there's just, it's just such a great title. And she goes, absolutely, he doesn't mind. Teach his whole thing. He doesn't care. I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm just done. Yeah. <laughs> I'll use part of it. But anyway, that's how it should be. You know, whatever you hear that's God, feel free to you know, pass it on. You actually did just teach some harfouche from the lesson I just listened to, so. <laughs> and some of it, like, you don't even know. Easy. You know what I mean? And then it yeah. becomes a part of you. And that's, that's why that's such a good thing is that you have to make sure that you're teaching Christ. Because if you're teaching yourself or something else, that's what you'll reproduce in the people. Now, so we got the oh, that's true. we got the religious leaders, you know, uh, upset. We got the people upset. Now, let's see what annoying teaching does to demons. <laughs> they really don't like it. Look at uh, Mark one twenty one. We're almost almost done. I love this story. So uh, twenty one through twenty eight. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, or shut up, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out a loud voice, he came out. And they were all amazed. They questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? Manna. You know that's what manna means? What is it? And he's not the bread from heaven. Yeah. The bread was teaching the bread. What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Teaching is supernatural. And so the more anointed the teaching is, the more it's going to rile up anything that's demonic and that's trying to hide, which tells me that a lot of what's being taught is not that anointed. Mm -hmm. So as we get even more anointing at the furnace, we're going to see people that used to, they could come and that demon would stay hidden, there'd be no big deal, and all of a sudden, ah, you know, it's going to fall off more stuff. So you guys need to be ready. Right? Have you take care of business? And then the they manifest. manifest and shove you. And yes. <laughs> You're like, oh, I see what you got. <laughs> All right, now, I did not know this. In Mark 6.34, there's so much in this tiny little book, Mark. He was a man of few words, for sure. You know John Mark that wrote Mark? He's the one that Paul and Barnabas had to fight over. Yeah, because he was Barnabas's, I think, nephew or cousin. He was a family member. And he went with him and Paul, their, one of their missionary trips, and he flaked out. He's hot and tired and he's going home. <coughs> so when Paul got back, I, I believe to Antioch, I'm not sure, and it's time to go again, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. And Paul's like, no. He's like, well, he'll be better than this. No. And they split. It was such a contention that they split. Paul took Luke, who wrote you know, Luke in the book of Acts, and then Barnabas took John Mark. Later, we find Paul, right before he's going to be killed, asking for John Mark to come to him. Isn't that so neat? he was one of the, the 12, though, right? No, not John Mark. Mm -hmm. So he, John Mark wrote this book. Mm -hmm. Book of Mark. Yeah. Oh, so like, if he didn't walk with them. So some of the, so this is where I get kind of confused today. Just write what they were told. And what they, they were taught. By the Holy, and then the Holy Spirit, and he was like, okay, and this is what happened. Yeah, this is the only book that was not written by one of the original 12 in the Gospels. Oh. That's really neat. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. The rest were. Um, and then the book of Acts, you know, Luke was a doctor, so I don't know if you notice these are very detailed. They're like, you know, 
50 something chapters, man. And, uh, and he wrote the book of Acts to a dude named Theophilus who wouldn't know about, you know, things. And so he got this entire, like, how many hours, days, weeks, months did it take him to write all that out? It's crazy. All right, so uh, 634. Yes. God showed me this today. I was shocked. And Jesus, when he went out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd, so he began to teach them many things. So his response here was to teach. And so teaching, just like doing miracles, is a, a, a compassion gift. And I never saw that ever. Like you would think that he'd gather them up and maybe pass out some food and you know different things, but he didn't do that this time. Compassion is different from sympathy or humanity, <coughs> and that compassion meets the need. Mm. So it's like um, the people may not even know what they need. You know what I mean? Like you might think that you need something else, but God will meet you with what you actually need, and He'll be moved with compassion for you. So other times you'd see him like compassion would hit him and he would heal people. Um, and so in this instance, he saw that they didn't have shepherds. That also shows you that a true shepherd's role is to provide good, good teaching, good food. And, uh, and it's the, the, the sheep's you know, responsibility is to receive that. So I, I asked the Lord why. I was like, well, in this instance, why was it teaching that was the answer? And he said, because good, sound teaching will instruct people in my ways, and that is what leads them <clears throat> out of bondage, poverty, sickness, wrong mindsets, bad relationships, and more. Instruction in God's ways leads to his life for those who receive it. So the more you learn, the more life you got. Mm -hmm. And then, Psalm 23. One through three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or lack, is what that means in the original. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Name's sake. Now, the green pastures is literally pastures of tender grass. And they have the most nutrients and the easiest to digest. And then still waters, obviously, is waters of rest in the original language. So if you allow him to, to teach you, to teach you his ways, you'll have the best nutrition spiritually, you'll, which means that you will grow at an accelerated pace where others maybe don't if they're not getting that. You'll have more peace in your life. And then you'll also walk more uprightly, meaning that when you're in situations, you will know the right way or the God way of what to do. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and this is what uh, I love. The teacher should always expect that their students will do more than them. See, a lot of times, ministers feel threatened if someone's operating in more power or accelerating in their learning more than them or whatever it is. But a true uh, shepherd, a true minister, will actually want their students to go further than them and will be humble enough to learn, right? So let me give you some scripture proof. Uh, John 14, 12, Most assuredly I say to you, he, who, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works will he do, because I go to my Father. He rejoiced when he saw his disciples doing the things that he did. So, uh, just know that like, any competition or comparing of yourself or any jealousy, uh, that is departing from a true uh, servant heart, you know? And also realizing that, and, and one of our um, activations is going to reveal this, all of you are different in personality, thought, and flavor. So you can have all the same scripture, and you're going to see something totally different. 
And that's what makes everything unite. You know, unity is not making everything or everybody <coughs> like you. It's being able to stay in unity even though everybody's different, you know? And uh, now what I want to do for the activation, I'm going to record what the instructions are and then we can turn it off. Um, what I want you guys to do, I want to uh, write this down if you don't have notes because I messed up on that. Um, in Genesis 26, I want you to read verses 1 through 6 and then 12 through 13. So you're going to skip a few uh, irrelevant verses uh, for our, our purposes. And then here's the question for you to ponder when you, when you read. What way of God or path of life is revealed in this story? That you can learn from, okay? So we're going to do that tonight after Ramona gets done. Or we can do it before if she prefers, but that will be our activation before we dismiss. And then each of you, I'll what go ahead. Of God us? Uh, what way of God or path of life is revealed in this story? And then uh, uh, you'll each share one thing. So you might get several things, and that's fine, but each of you will share one thing. And I want us to take note of how from that one passage, all of you will have different insights. That's why we need each other. That's why we're a body. We're not all a bunch of big toes walking around. <laughs> oh, I need that. Yeah, he's a big old toe. <laughs> all right, and then number two. So this is over the next month. So take note because I want it the next time we meet. Uh, you're going to study Matthew 15, 21 through 28. And you're going to list several ways of God in it that you see, okay? Now, I picked a difficult story because I want you to rely on Holy Spirit and not human reasoning. So if you only see the negative, you're in your mind. But if you, if you see what's actually going on in this story, it'll be from Holy Spirit. So beware of that. If there's any negative kind of creeping in or that was kind of mean when you said that, then you're, you're in your head, okay? Just to give you a clue. So several ways of God? Mm-hmm, yeah. So look for several ways of God in it, because that's what it's about, right? Finding how He works, His ways. And look for what God is doing and revealing in His interaction with this lady. Okay. So we can go ahead and close that, and if we could turn the temperature up before we all shiver out of our seats, that would be awesome. <laughs> if you wanted to. If you could just close for a quarter, and then I guess turn the air up to what, 72 or 73? That's not 72. Okay, we'll just put on 72.